uh, hymn number 502, Right Now That Prayer of God. Welcome this morning to New Hope on the third Sunday of Easter. Does anyone have any announcements that's not in the bulletin? Okay. Well, that, you can join the happy group of great-grandparents. See? I was at Big Red Ball Field one night this week, started at the Pee Wee Field, went to the next field to watch two of mine play. So it's, a, it's really a blessing. I got another one coming in May. Another one coming in May. Well, okay, you'll catch up with me before. I'm <laughs> Is anybody, uh, Craig, I, we've had the announcement in the over email about the blood drive, I guess that was considered successful? Craig? Oh, yeah. the, you considered the blood drive successful? Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's con uh, uh, go from our announcements to our prayer concerns. Um, we have the list in, in our bulletin as usual. And then Pastor Betty has asked that we pray for her mother, Margaret Alexander. Uh, she is having issues with congestive heart failure. So um, please keep her in your prayers also. Does anyone else have any other prayer concerns? Then let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we gather together today to give you thanks and praise for your greatness. We praise your mighty works to the whole world. We praise you for your wonderful deeds. Your power is limitless. 
Your wisdom is unparalleled. Your grace is overwhelming. Your love is never failing. You promise that you will never leave or forsake us. Let us worship you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and join me in the reading of the General Liturgy number 2 for Reconciliation on page 13. Almighty God, enthroned above all, you alone are God over the nations of the earth. Even the planets, the stars, and the galaxies are placed by your hand. Where could we go from your spirit? Where could we flee from your presence? If we go up to the heavens, you are there. If we go down into the caves of the earth or the depths of the sea, you are there. God of all creation, we sing praises to your name. We stand jubilant before your glory, power, and beauty. God of certainty, God of truth, our confidence is in you and in you alone. Yet we live in a fallen world and we are an imperfect people. Our world is filled with pain and alienation. We know of illness when body or mind is failing, and the loneliness of spirit it brings. We know of separation from parent or child, from friend or neighbor, and the emptiness of life it brings. We know of strangeness in new communities and in changing communities, and the longing it brings. We know of alienation caused by unemployment or poverty or discrimination and the pain it brings. We have become strangers to our relatives and foreigners to our own families. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Let our cry for help come to you. I am a God nearby, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? I am the Lord your God. I have called you out from the peoples, and you shall be holy to me. We declare your praise. The one who called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to you.
You may be seated. Gracious God, we humbly confess that we walk in the way of the indifferent, who depend on their strength alone. We sit among the scornful, who deny the need for your guidance and power. Our hearts are not satisfied with riches, vulnerable to moth and rust and thief, yet we zealously store up those very treasures. Set our mind on things unseen and eternal, that our emptiness within may be filled. We humbly confess that we fail to welcome the stranger among us. We pass by the neighbor who is hungry and thirsty, naked, sick, and in prison. We sing of your healing power and your unconditional love, but we fail to make our sanctuaries true havens for the suffering and the exile. Give us the will to be ambassadors for our Savior, faithful stewards in the ministry of reconciliation entrusted to us. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. Without Christ, we were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. We are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, with Christ himself as a cornerstone. Therefore, let us affirm our faith in the triune God. Please stand. We one God, who has created the land and sea and heaven and all that is in them, who established a world that was good, who gives to us the task of watchful and responsible care over it, who is certainty and truth. We believe in the one God, who in Jesus Christ assumed our humanity and knew our life as child, youth, and adult, who dined with sinners and lived with the homeless, who confronted popular opinion and power, who remained obedient in temptation and suffering, whose triumph was a servant's death and resurrection. We believe in the one God who comes to us as comforter and advocate, who does not leave us as orphans, who brings peace and calm to troubled hearts, who bestows gifts for serving, healing, showing compassion, and doing miracles, who alone is the power and the wisdom of our proclamation. Let us in faith keep our eyes fixed on the promises of God, though we see them and greet them from a distance. We confess that we are strangers and foreigners on the earth, a people who are seeking our true home. We desire a better place, that is, a heavenly one, Indeed, God has prepared a city for us. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us.
may be seated. As you entered worship, you had the opportunity to give of your tithes and your offerings. Always remember that it is to God that we give our praises, that we give our prayers, and we give our gifts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and almighty God, Lord, we come before you today. And Lord, we, we come as your chosen people. We come as your people to serve you and to worship you. Today, Lord, we bring our offerings to you and our tithes. And Lord, we bring them not out of fear that we will not have enough, but we bring them knowing that you are the great God of abundance. And Lord, that you have given us much more than we could ever need or use. And yet you still are so good to us. So Lord, we pray today that as the giver gives, may they give not out of their scarcity, but out of their abundance, out of their plenty. Lord, let them give so that others might hear of the good news of Jesus Christ, your loving Son. Amen. Thank you. 
let us now transition into the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Our scriptures today come from Acts 2, 14, 36 through 41, Psalms 116, 1 through 4, 12 through 19, 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23, and the Gospel of Luke 24, 13 through 35. Hear now the holy word of God. Our first passage is from Acts 2, verse 14 and 36 through 41. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this, so that everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter had said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy, because he bends down to listen. I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. And Psalm 116, 12 through 19. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord cries deeply when his loved ones die. When his loved ones die. O oh Lord, I am your servant. Yes, I am your servant, born into your household. You have freed me from my chains. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the house of the Lord, in the heart of Jerusalem, praise the Lord. And from 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or re reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, and now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. And from Luke 24, 13 through 35. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came 
and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped, sadness written on their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early that morning, early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they had seen the angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and surely enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Jesus. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. May God bless the reading of his holy word today and may he give to each one of us clear understanding. I invite you to please stand as we sing our hymn of preparation, Jesus, Master, Whose I Am, number 614. Thank you. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord Jesus, you on this third Sunday of Easter did conquer death. You rose from the dead, and you are alive. And because of this, you have redeemed, you have restored and reinstated us with our Heavenly Father. Help us to never forget what you have done for us. You are our living Savior. There is no other like you. You walk with us on our daily journeys. You show us the pathway that we're to follow. You encourage us. You help us in our times of struggles and grief. Lord, we pray this morning that you might open up our hearts and minds and prepare us for the words that you have us to hear today. We pray that you would fill us to overflowing with your strength and your courage that we might be a light in the darkness of this world. Today, Lord, we celebrate that you are a risen Savior and that you have reconciled us to you. Give us ears to hear your truth today. Lord, I thank you for my voice. I thank you for the opportunity that I have to speak your truth to your people. Lord, I will step aside. I pray that you will fill my mouth with your words. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, today the story that we hear, it is a story that we hear every year about this time of year. And it's one that's worth repeating again and again and again. Have you noticed that a lot of times some of the stories we hear especially as we go through the lectionary in the calendar year, some of those stories will be very familiar to you because we hear them each year. And today, at, at the very heart, our gospel is at the very heart of Jesus' resurrection and that he is a living Savior. And it highlights our hope that we have because he is a resurrected Savior and that he is a living Savior. The Apostle Paul wrote to his friends in Corinth, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead. So we're serving a risen Savior, a Savior who lives and walks with us every day in everything that we do. And today as we talk about these two that experience the people on this road to Emmaus, they had lost all hope. And let us think about them. Think about if you were in their shoes and you were walking, you had a seven-mile walk, and on your journey, your journey started as a heartbreaking experience. Your heart was broken. Have any of you ever had your heart broken? But it turns out that what became a heartbreaking experience turned into a heartburning experience for them. And But one thing I thought about as I was preparing today's homily, I thought about, have you ever thought about that heartbreaking experiences? They usually begin with the letter D. Doubt, defeat, despair, disappointment, discouragement. And death sometimes. All of these sum up the words of Cleophas and his companion. Discouragement. And yet here they were walking with this stranger who joined them on the Emmaus Road. They didn't recognize Jesus. They were, they were discouraged. They were dismayed and dispirited by all the events that had happened on Good Friday. And surely you can sympathize with them. Surely you have experienced a time of confusion in your life, a time when you really had lost all hope. Maybe it was a time of grief, a time of 
different things, health issues, financial issues, relationship issues, whatever it may have been. And you felt that things looked hopeless. Well, the master they had revered and loved and followed all this time, now bear in mind, they had given up everything to follow him. He was it for them. They had put all their hope into him. And now he's no longer here. You can see how they would feel hopeless. How would we have been? If you were on this, you had all this hope and all these things were built up. This happens in relationships a lot of times. Things are going really good and all of a sudden it kind of goes south. And things aren't so good. But things aren't always good. There are things around us that happen that are not good, and yet it brings good in our lives. And when I think about these two men and their discouragement and the distress that they were feeling, I could certainly say that I relate to them. They felt like their life was coming apart. And the two, these two disciples, they put it this way. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They had hoped that he was the redeemer. He was the Messiah. And now it's no more. He's not here. Think about that. I think when we are studying God's word and when we're really going through these lessons, we need to put ourselves in the position of these people. Don't just read about it. That's why reading is so good. Because you're thinking, oh man, they went on this journey. They did this. They did that. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel? Human hope is a fragile thing. And when you lose your hope, It's like your human spirit is suffering. And it's a hard thing to cure. Believe me, I'm sure if, if Alman were here today and we do miss him, if he were here, he would tell you he's dealt and counseled a lot of people that their human spirit was suffering. They'd lost hope. I have. I've dealt with people who totally have lost hope. Sometimes that comes when you lose a loved one. Lose your hope. But our hope should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we should put our hope. When we think about our despair and feeling hopeless, many times it can carry on until people become depressed about it. They become so hopeless, it becomes severe and they're discouraged and depressed. Jesus' followers on the road to Emmaus, they felt hopeless. They felt like they, they had nothing to look forward to. I can identify with these men on the road, and I'm sure many of you can. There's been times that you've had and felt hopeless in your life. You felt like things are never going to get any better. They're just going to be the way they are. And then suddenly, things start to change. It's like you'll have 10 days of rain and then all of a sudden the sun shines. And it's like, wow, that just lifts your spirits. We like the rain, but we still like the sunshine. Kind of lifts our spirits. As the travelers made their weary way toward on the Emmaus Road, this stranger falls in behind them. They didn't recognize Jesus. And as they're traveling and walking, they're talking. You know, I like to walk and talk. When I walk and talk, it goes faster. And uh, they're telling the stranger how they're feeling. And they just talked about how this was, he, he was their Messiah. He was going to be their Redeemer. And he was going to change history. And all of a sudden, that's not happening. Because he's gone. 
we know that the stranger was the risen Jesus? But they didn't know that. And quite frankly, they didn't recognize Jesus. And because, this was because they'd lost their hope. And Jesus goes on to talk about, when he's talking, he talks about how he called them foolish people because they had had the words of the prophets, they had had his words, and yet they still did not believe that he would rise. Remember, he said he's going to return on the third day. Well, in 1887, 22 years after President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, his coffin was dug up and opened because of constant rumors that his body was not in the grave. So they dug it up, and the body was still there. The rumors continued, and 14 years later, they dug it up again. Both times, witnesses testified Lincoln was still in the grave. Yet, Three days after the death of Jesus Christ, similar rumors began to spread. All throughout Israel, everywhere, this was the talk of the town. Well, only this time there were no witnesses who could say that they had seen his body. In fact, quite the contrary. They couldn't say they had seen his body because his body had disappeared. It was no longer in the tomb. It was like he had just vanished. Well, as great a man as Lincoln was, there were witnesses who could testify that his body was still in the grave. And yet, if we or anyone would cry out to Lincoln for help, Lincoln would not be able to help. Same thing, if we would cry out to Einstein, he could not help us. Those that cry out to Muhammad, Buddha, and Gandhi. It's only silence. They're not going to respond. However, if we cry out to our Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to hear us and he is going to respond. The spirit that lives within us is going to lead and guide us. He hears us. When we talk about Jesus the Good Shepherd and we talk about how he knows the voice of his sheep, he knows their voice. He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves, actually. We serve a living Savior. He's alive. And he is so real. You know, when I talk to people, and they say to me, we don't, we don't get there. You are so convinced that he's alive and that he's so real. And you make it seem almost like it's really real. I'm like, it is real. He's alive. He's our risen Savior. And you know, it, it has to really, the belief, that he is alive and that he is your savior has to really pierce your heart. And when we believe, we believe. And our life is never the same because we are changed. Our hearts are changed. Jesus said, unless a seed dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. <laughs> Think about that. In Jesus' infinite love, Jesus always meets us where we are. And many times we have to die to ourselves in things. We have to let these things go in our lives. Things that hold us back from Jesus. But sometimes that's hard. People don't want to. They enjoy the sin. They don't want to let it go. we need to listen to the words of God. And we need to think about what Jesus is saying. Unless a seed dies, it abides alone. And it does not bear much fruit. When you receive 
Christ and you receive the Holy Spirit and you go out and you minister, like just like these men, I'm jumping ahead, but after they realized who Jesus was, they were going to go out and tell everybody. That's what we need to do. Don't be ashamed of your faith. Share your faith. Share your excitement. I've always said, if I'm going to make a fool of myself, it's going to be over the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when I think about these men, and I think about what God has done for us in our lives, and the hope that he gives us, even in our hopelessness, in times that we feel overwhelmed and hopeless, we hold on to our faith. You know, it's funny how as time comes around and you start to remember, um, it will be six years tomorrow that Jim passed away, my husband Jim. And it's amazing how that day just comes to you. Those people that you lost and you love, and it just comes. It was on a Monday. I was thinking about it this morning as I was driving to church. I was driving. It's a normal day that day. We had church. When I went back home, it was just like a normal day. We had time together. And the next morning, things started to change. And my life changed forever. And so when you think about those things in your life, you know, you can feel hopeless, but our hope is not in an individual. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love those people. We love them, and we still love them. But we love Jesus Christ, and we worship him, and he's with us. And I get chills telling you this because it is so true. We have to keep when you have things that come your way and they're tough, you have to just dig in and get a little bit tougher with them and know that the Lord Jesus Christ is there with you, walking with you in every way. And he's going to strengthen us. And I, I really thought about these two disciples, the followers, and how they felt about the sense of their hopelessness and despair. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, I'll follow you, Lord, but I've still got my house and I've still got everything and I've still got a place to stay and I've still got all my family. These people, many of them gave up everything, everything to follow Jesus. And think about that. You've, you've given everything up. And all of a sudden, everything you gave it up for is gone. It's not there with you. Of course they felt distressed. But their eyes had not quite been opened yet. Well, in our story today, we're told that Jesus acted if he was going further as the men were traveling on. It was a test to see how the men would react. Did they have an appetite for more? Did they want him to come and stay with them? Well, we're told that they urged Jesus strongly, it says, stay with us. This is an invitation for Jesus to stay with them. It was one he couldn't resist. So he went, as we know in the story, and he stayed with them. Scripture says their hearts had been won over. They had a basic meal, but quickly, when things started to transition here, the bread was on the table, and the moment that Jesus' disclosure came about is he took the bread, and he blessed the bread, and then he gave it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And think about this, as he's serving them, they see his hands. They're not like the hands that served the disciples in the upper room. 
They see his hands, scarred hands. And all of a sudden, their hearts are burning with excitement. They know and they recognize him. This is him. This is Jesus. All of a sudden, their faith started to burn within them and they believed. Think about that. Have you ever had a moment that it was like an aha moment? That it was like, oh, I get that now. Didn't understand that before. Scripture has so much for us to learn. There's so much we can learn. That's why it's so wonderful to study the Word and to stay in the Word. Because you're going to grasp things all the time. That's why I, I love planning and doing the sermons and, and getting the messages ready and everything because, and I like doing the lectionary because I have to stay on it every week. And it feeds me. I hope it feeds you. But it's one of the things that God's word feeds us. And it's one of those things that can change our lives. It's like taking that bread and giving thanks and break it. And it's like we take and we should be thankful for everything. I find in my life, especially in the past years, I find myself being so thankful to God for so many things. So many things. Even in the times of struggle, thanking him. Thanking him that he brought this person in my life. That I was blessed by this person. And that I could minister to a particular person. Thankful. Being thankful for what we have is so important. We live in a society that it's all we want more and more and more. But with God, little is so much. And when you think about these two men, I think about they had a heart-changing experience from heartbreaking to heart-burning. Now their hearts are on fire. They are burning for the Lord. They are ready. They're believing. And they're ready to go out and share their faith. And they not only just believe, they've seen. They've seen his hand. And we know the story. It wasn't too long until after this, everything, all of a sudden, Jesus just, he's gone. He's not there. And see, Jesus calls us to believe in him. We have not seen him, but we believe. Blessed are those who believe and they have not seen Think about that. Some people are kind of a show and tell. I mean, you got to show them, you got to tell them, and then you got to show them again. We believe. We have not seen God, but we believe. Think about that. And I also think as I saw the, the two men walking along, and I'm thinking about, we should never give up our search to continue to draw our relationship in a greater way with the Lord. Don't get stagnant. I'm a Christian. I go to church. No. Always keep searching. Always keep wanting to grow in your faith. You know, I, I hope and I pray as long as I have breath, that I'll be able. That's why I'm so grateful for my voice. Because see, I know and realize the seriousness of the surgery that I had last year. And if you can believe, it's just been a year. Hard to believe. You'll probably start really recovering after about a year. Well, I knew that was not going to happen with God. God works things a whole lot faster for me usually. And he just started working and working. 
And when I look back on it and I think now, I think, wow, it's hard to believe it's just been a year. And yet I am very, very grateful that I do have a voice because I know I could not have. I still struggle sometimes with things, but that's okay. It's like I tell people, you learn to deal with the things. If you hurt your leg or you have something, you have a limp, you learn to limp. You learn to do what you need to do to do what God's called you to do. And I'm so grateful, so grateful that he called me into the ministry because many years I didn't, I just didn't, that was not what I wanted to do. I didn't feel that's what I needed to be doing. And yet when I look back, I think my greatest blessing has been is to be a pastor and especially to be a pastor here. I have been blessed. And as I said earlier, blessed by being with Phyllis. She's my buddy. We enjoy working together so much. And the music and things, it's just, she just opens the music for me. I mean, it's one of those things, I don't read music, but I depend on her. And she can help me get on. And, and it's a blessing. It's a true blessing. We serve a living Savior. And I think today, what I'd like for us to take away from this story is that we all need hope. All of us need hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. He is our living Savior. And if you cry out to him, he's going to be there. He's going to help you. He's going to, the Holy Spirit is going to work within you in a way. But you've got to listen you got to be attentive. And sometimes you've got to even be willing to make some changes in your life. We serve a living Savior. And I pray that we realize what that means. It's not just about our life here on this earth. It's about one day we will have and be in heaven and we'll be in our heavenly home. With the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. What a day it will be. What a day it will be. So I would tell you today for us as believers. Knowing that we serve a living Savior. We should go forth into the world. And we should share with others. Our faith. Might just be with a smile. Might be a pat on the back. Might be a card, a book, a call, a meal. Smile, kind word. We don't know. But let us not fail to share Jesus. Because we have recognized that he is the living Savior. And we believe. So let us share our faith with others. And let us experience, not just at Easter, but let us experience all of this time through the Easter season and beyond about our faith. And let us have that peace and that hope that comes from our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has risen. He has risen indeed.